Your grace will be enough when my eyes can see what you have prepared for me. Your grace will be enough. And strength is rising as I wait patiently. Your words, they comfort me. Strength is rising. Lift up your heads, you weary souls, our God. Is not done yet. Our King will come with the morning light, bringing joy to the darkest of night. Carry on, all you pilgrims. Don't lose heart, for the journey is long. At the end. Your hands and bless the Lord. Carry on, all you pilgrims. Don't lose heart, His strength will still come. At the end of your wanderings, you'll see the grace that He giveth and giveth and giveth again. Be enough when I cannot hear. When I start to fear, your word will be enough. Your voice will lead me in when I can't escape. The quiet place, your voice will lead me in. Lift up your heads, you weary souls. Our God is not done yet. A king will come with the morning light, bringing joy. To the darkest of night, carry on, all、oh, you pilgrims. Don't lose heart, for the journey is long. At the end of your wanderings, lift your hands and bless the Lord. Carry on.
carry on all you pilgrims don't lose heart his strength will still come at the end of your wanderings you'll see the grace that he giveth and giveth and giveth again Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'd love to say it's a wonderful day. <laughs> but I think it is. It is a wonderful day. Yeah. 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 And we can yeah. come yeah. here and celebrate the worship of the Lord. And let's just open it with prayer. Oh, before I do, let me just say, lovely to see you back again, Anna, with the children. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Anyway, let's open it with prayer. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us safely through this week. And that you have been with us through the good and the bad times. For you are a faithful, compassionate, living God who promises to never leave us or forsake us. And may our thanksgiving, praise and worship this morning be wholly acceptable to you, Lord. And may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. And may you be delighted by it. For it is you and you alone who are worthy praise and worship. Holy Spirit, prepare our hearts and minds this morning, that we may not only receive and understand your word, but that we may put it into practice in our lives. Bless Sue as she comes to minister the word to us. Grant her a special anointing of your spirit, Lord, that she may speak truth and life into us. We ask all of this in and through the precious name of our Lord, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. First hymn this morning is you know, the word of God the Father. Thank you. 
to half past five and spread the word if you can about it so that the people can come and have some toast and whatever. <laughs> so, uh, let's just hope and pray for them. And then Bible study and prayer meeting. Now there is no prayer meeting on Tuesday because on Thursday we have a speaker come to us which is Phil Davis of Sporting Mar Marbles and he will be there on the, this Thursday at 10.30. So, all please attend if you can. Then Lighthouse on Friday, and then the big administrative one, church meeting on the 1st of December. And all members to attend. <laughs> please. <laughs> right. But then, there's more, there's more, because we look at it, the program for Christmas. And if you start on the left, and work down, and then go over to the right, and work down, you'll see the whole thing for the month. So, Friday the 13th at 5pm, Lighthouse Christmas Party, with a special guest. I can't for the life of me think who's going to be you know, but there is a special guest for you. And then on Sunday the 15th, we have our family carol service at 11am. And then on the Monday, which is a coffee and cake normally, but look at it, it's Christmas coffee and cake. And, oh, there is secret Santa with presents for one and all. <clears throat> Maybe for one and all, you know, <laughs> right? And then on Sunday the 21st, it's the Carols by Candlelight at 4 p.m. Please remember 4 p.m. for that. Wednesday the 25th, the Christmas Day service is normally a short service, no more than about half an hour. We hope. 
anyway, but it's normally abbreviated one. And then on Sunday the 29th at 11 o'clock, there's the year-end family service. But then there's one that everyone's looking forward to, surely. On the 31st of December, Tuesday the 31st, it's the Gibbs's Hoot and Annie. <laughs> and it starts at 7.30, and I'm told quite not a categorically that it will close at two minutes past 12. <laughs> <laughs> so be, be very quick with your old man's sign and then get on <laughs> So there hopefully are the uh, programmes for the, for, for the month, basically. Now let's turn into the, the memory verse. And I can promise you one thing. We will not be singing the memory verse today. <laughs> I know, I know you're going to miss it all, but I think it's just, let's just say it together. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. 2 Kings 6, verse 16b. How about another one? Because I didn't hear it very loud. Come on, now, let's, let's all hear it and declare it to the Lord. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. 2 Kings Sixteen, sixteen, B. I got that wrong, didn't I? <laughs> Beg your pardon. Anyway, okay. Now let's continue our worship together by just saying the Lord's prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. We forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For our kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, during the next hymn, the children will be going out up to the Lighthouse Lounge. Uh, but before we do, let's just, let's just pray for them. Father God, we thank you for the children that come to this church, Lord. Lord, we, they are such a blessing to us, and let's hope that they will be a blessing to you, Lord. And Lord, we pray for the team that go out with them, that they may share the love of Jesus with them. In the name of them, come to know them as their own personal Saviour. For we ask all these things through Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. And our next hymn is, Great is the Lord and Most Worthy. Thank you. 
first reading is from Isaiah chapter 41, verses 11 <laughs> to 14. I think you can find that on page 727 in the, uh, the Bible. And chapter 41, it's the helper of Israel. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help. Do not be afraid, you worm, Jacob, little Israel. Do not fear, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. This text gives us grace in two small words. Well, actually, in this version, it's three more words. And that's, do not fear. But I like the old King James version of fear not, fear not. Um, at one time or another, most of us have been gripped with fear. It's no wonder that these two words, fear not, are frequently found throughout the scriptures. In fact, the phrase is fear not, or be not afraid, occur more than 100 times in the Bible. In all our fears, may we learn to look to Jesus, for he is the antidote to fear, anxiety, and worry. When the Lord applies these two words, fear not, to our hearts, they sustain and support us. And consider the context of what we're talking about here. The people of Israel had just found out they were going to be sent into captivity into Babylon. They needed a word from the Lord, and he gave it. Fear not. The Lord was on their side. And if the Lord is on our side, all must eventually be well. For the Lord is all sufficient for every emergency and each need. In Christ, we lack nothing. In Christ, we have enough to meet every necessity. Notice how the people of Israel are called worms, yet the Lord has grace for them. And that's the way it is with us. Jesus takes us at our worst and gives us grace. If he only took notice of us when we were great and continually strong, we would perish. But the Lord looks at us at our lowest when we are down in the depths. These two words, fear not, revive, restore, and renew. Yet if we look at the future, and there seems to be a mountain of obstacles fast approaching us. But here's the good news. God is the God of mountains. He is with us, no matter what we are going through. And because of the shed blood of Calvary, there is no longer separation between us and God. There are no mountains of division. As the prophet, as the apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. But let me finish by reciting these words of Martin Luther. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us, the prince of darkness great. We tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. Two little words shall tell him, fear not. And that's the gospel truth. Amen. <laughs> Let us go into prayer.
We thank you, Jesus, for giving yourself to Calvary for us all. And that by your shed blood, all our sins are forgiven and amazingly forgotten. And that all our sicknesses and diseases are to be healed. And for crowning us with your love and compassion. We take time now to lift up to you all those who are suffering, whether physically, mentally, or spiritually. They who need a touch from you this day, Lord. And we thank you, Jesus, that you know and care about every single per person and circumstance we have laid before you. It's wonderful to see Emma back with us, with the children. And Lord, we, we just thank you for the blessing that they give us. And Lord, we thank you for the freedom we have to worship you without fear of perse persecution in our country. But we do remember our persecuted church brothers and sisters who suffer so much at the hands of wicked governments. We pray for their protection, provision, and assurance of your love for them. We lift our community to you, Lord. Enable us, your church, here to know your vision of service for them and to willingly engage in it. Help us in the sharing of our faith so that we may produce a full understanding and appreciation of every good thing that we have in Christ Jesus. May we be salt and light to the community and local area around us. But above all, may they see Christ in us, the hope of glory. Lord, we know that you are Jehovah Shaw, the God of peace. And we pray that you will undertake the hostilities that are occurring around the world today. We pray especially for the situation in Gaza and the Ukraine, that they will raise up peacemakers to intercede. And we pray for our families, for our friends and our neighbours. They all may come to know you, Lord, as their own personal saviour. And let us just take time, a few moments, to bring the names of them before the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for we ask all these requests and petitions in and through the precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> During the next hymn, Steve, yeah, Steve will be uh, taking the offering. And then the hymn is, All My Days I Will Sing the Song of Gladness. And you've got a little
Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 to 22. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. But God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, ready for battle. <coughs> Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day and <coughs> night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night, left its place in front of the people. And the second reading is from the Gospel of John, and it's from verses 4, sorry, verses 1 to 26. The title of the chapter is Jesus Talks with a Samaritan Woman. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although in fact it was not Jesus who had baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sichar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob dwelled with there, and Jesus, tired as he was from a journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, 
leading up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The woman, Jesus replied, believe me, the time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come and the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, the one speaking to you, I am he. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of me. And now soon we'll come to the midst of the bread. <coughs> Shall we pray? Shall we come to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together. We ask now that you open up our ears so that we, can, so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And it's not a very nice day today, but we are here. Where else would we be? <laughs> Um, so this week we're going to continue our series of So What. Dom has been doing it for the last six weeks ago, uh, so we, uh, six weeks or so. So so what? And today um, we're going to really look at how we respond to Jesus. So this morning we are focusing on travel. When we think about travel, we think of far places. But do you know what? We all travel a lot of the time. And you know, the average person travels for about three years during their lifetime. And St. Augustine said, the world is a book, and those who do not travel read only a page. When we think about travel, we automatically think about traveling to distant countries, but we travel all the time in our daily lives, driving or catching the bus to the supermarket to do the weekly shop, walking to the local shop, cafe or library, going for a walk, or walking <coughs> dogs on a crisp, cold, sunny afternoon, or even a damp, wet, cold <laughs> morning. We're all constantly <coughs> moving, and it's, it is a significant part of our lives. So what do we do during the time that we're travelling? Well, often, we fill it with Dead, with this dead space, we can fill with stuff to keep us occupied, such as scrolling through our phones, looking at messages, social media, listening to aimlessly to not a lot on the radio, because there isn't a lot on there, staring out the window at nothing in particular, counting sheep maybe, a few cows, if you see them. And you may think of many more of things that you do when you travel. I love traveling. I haven't done it a lot recently over the last, um, well, since COVID really, I haven't travelled very much. But for someone who likes to travel, I love the fact that many people in the Bible rarely stayed in one place. Movement and travel has always been a big part of Christian experience. So many of the giants of the faith have been travellers. Abraham and Sarah moved from Ur to Canaan, down to Egypt and back again. 
Isaac, Rebecca and Jacob, they all moved back and forth. And as Alan just read, the Israelites, of course, they traveled around for 40 years. And Jonah even traveled in a whale. <coughs> Naomi and Ruth by foot or donkey, and the list goes <coughs> on. They traveled because God told them to, or to avoid difficult circumstances. And if we think of Jesus himself, who from birth was a bit of a roving exile, he was frequently homeless and dependent on the hospitality of others on the roads he traveled. But on those roads, those journeys that he took, he changed many lives. <clears throat> and one of those lives, we're going to discuss in a little more detail now. Alan just read from John 4, verses 1 to 26. And here we read of Jesus' interaction with the Samaritan woman. So to set the scene, in Jesus' day, the country of Israel was divided into three parts. You had Judea, which was in the south, you had Galilee in the north, and then Samaria was somewhere in the middle. So if someone travelled from Judea to Galilee, the easiest route was to pass through Samaria. However, most Jews avoided this area. Why? Well, the Samaritans were Jews who were mixed <laughs> with other people groups during the exile period, leading to cultural and religious adaptation. They had their own temple and their own version of the Mosaic law. Therefore, the religious leaders in Jerusalem despised and avoided them. Not so with Jesus, as we read in verse 4. It says he had to pass through Samaria. This phrase does not mean he had any other option. He did, because normally Jews crossed, crossed the river Jordan and made a detour. But Jesus had to do this because it was part of God's plan. It was part of God's plan that he would go to Samaria and preach the gospel there. His mission could not be hindered by cultural boundaries or by people's dislike of other people groups. Jesus had not come for just the Jews, but for people from all languages and nations. And Jesus was fully God and fully human, and he got tired from traveling and he had to rest. Jesus journeyed and he got tired very much like we do. But even though the earthly Jesus felt tired and thirsty, he kept his divine appointment with this Samaritan woman at this well. Jesus won the woman's trust by humbling himself, by naming his thirst, can you give me a drink? By asking for something <coughs> that he knew she could give him. There is no triumphalism in his approach, no smugness, no arrogance. He's thirsty, and he just says so. And then what, what happened was an honest dialogue followed. As, we, as Alan read earlier, the woman had a history of multiple marriages, and at that time she was living with a man who was not her husband. Her past and present actions could have led others to judge and condemn her, but Jesus approached her with unconditional love and grace. Instead of focusing on her mistakes, Jesus saw her as a person worthy of compassion and acceptance. And then Jesus engaged in her in a meaningful conversation, addressing her spiritual thirst and offering her living water, representing profound spiritual fulfillment and forgiveness. Jesus' love for this Samaritan woman was not contingent on her past or her moral standing. Rather, it was love that looked beyond her mistakes and embraced her as a cherished individual. He offered her the opportunity to experience transformation and possibility of a new beginning. Oh, this encounter teaches us that God's love is boundless and all-encompassing. It teaches us in our brokenness and imperfection, it is not based on our merits of our ability to be faultless. I, for one, am so thankful for that. It is a gift that is freely given to us. And finally, she reached a crucial moment in the encounter 
and acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah. She understood him to be the saviour, the long-awaited anointed one who could bring salvation and hope. For us, the heart of the matter lies in the depth of the relationship with Jesus. It's when we move beyond seeing him solely as a teacher or prophet that we unlock the full transformative potential of our connection with him. Just as the Samaritan woman's understanding of Jesus evolved, so too can ours, leading us to a deep and intimate relationship with him. The same people who had once shunned her now saw her transformed countenance and yet wondered what had happened. A simple yet powerful testimony resonated deeply with the villagers. They were intrigued by the authenticity and transformation they witnessed in her life. And what happened? Well, this led to more opportunities for Jesus to speak to the Samaritans, the other villagers, in her, in, in her town. And as a result of Jesus taking this route, what happened? Well, we read in verses 39 to 42, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. So the Samaritans came to him. They urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because you told us, or you've said, now we have heard it ourselves, and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. <coughs> it's a great story, isn't it? Really great. It's such a good story of, of uh, Jesus' love and grace and non-judgment non of people. But what does this story mean for us as believers? But just as the Samaritan woman's encounter with Jesus led many in the villages to believe, our testimonies, rooted in the truth of Jesus' love, have the power to draw others to our Saviour. As we share the good news with genuine enthusiasm, we become vessels through which God's transformative grace can touch the lives of those around us. We are an embodied people which means that we follow Jesus' ways and imitate him in the way he lived and treated others. Jesus calls us to put aside the stereotypes we carry, the prejudices we nurse, the social and cultural lines we draw, and see others through eyes of love, not judgment. So how can we live in response to Jesus in the time we are travelling <coughs> or moving about? We can do that by better using that dead space on our travels and journeys um, and to deepen our relationship with Jesus. And we can do that by spending quality time with him, just like a friendship. The more time you spend with Jesus, the deeper your relationship becomes. And praying consistently, not just in times of need, but also to give thanks and pray for others. Prayer allows us to recognise that Jesus is always reaching out to us. We can memorise and meditate on scripture, read the Bible, listen to podcasts and meditate on a few lines each day. We can practise gratitude and be thankful for God's hand in our lives. Listening and singing to worship music, even if you don't sing aloud, let the words of the worship reflect on our hearts and minds and praise God. And we don't have to do any of this. We can just be silent in his presence. Be still. Or be silent and still within his presence. Because spending time with Jesus changes us. Speaking honestly to the King of Kings allows us to find out our true identity. And while we're on our journeys, we can use this time by asking God for opportunities to engage with and help others. Like Jesus, we can become a soft landing for people who are alone or carrying stories too heavy to bear. 
To see brokenness without shaming is not easy, but it's not this what we are called to do. So we can invite others along with us on our journey. Meaningful conversations are not always about sitting and talking. Some of the deepest conversations I have had is usually when I'm walking and talking. By actively listening to others, listening well, because when we listen, we hear. There's a Greek philosopher called, let me see if I can say this right, Epictetus. He said, we have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. It can be easy for us to ramble on or feel the need to come up with a solution to other people's problems. But it's when we listen well that we truly hear the other person. And when we're traveling, we can look for opportunities to share the good news of Jesus and offer our testimonies. They are very powerful and people do like to, listen, to hear them. As we saw earlier, when the Samaritan woman at the well believed, what did she do? She immediately ran off to tell others. And her words made an impact because many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. So for us, it's about using our travel time productively to glorify God. Jesus had to travel, we have to travel, and we are already a travelling people. Alan read Exodus 13 earlier on. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on their way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light. The Lord is leading his people out of Egypt into the promised land. They had no roads to follow and no guide to lead them, but God graciously came to them and provided a guide the angel of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus now leads us in the wilderness like a flock. He is the light that shines on our path. Just as the pillar went before the Israelites leading them on their journey, so Jesus does the same for us. John wrote in, in one, chapter 1, 4 to 5, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus is our resident guide, our indwelling guide in heaven. To be a Christian is to be a pilgrim. We are pilgrims travelling through a strange land on our way to eternal glory. And if we think about traditional pilgrims, they followed well-trodden paths of saints and teachers to sacred sites. Their destination was not the place to which they travelled, but to a deeper place within, where they'd grown in faith along the journey, a strengthening of their devotion. And in her article, Meet the Modern Day Pilgrims, Helen Avery adds to this and said, the modern pilgrim also seeks the profound meaning within. Their love of travelling is one that grows and deepens in the small steps taken with empty hands and an open heart. The truth is, before we even leave our own doorsteps, we are all pilgrims. Yes, all of us. It's all about having a spirit of adventure and a willingness to discover God's voice in our lives and discover more of what it means to walk spiritually with God. In 1 Peter, chapter 1, 18 to 21, Peter demonstrates the value God has placed on us by showing us that he paid for us with the blood of his son. Jesus <coughs> took the greatest journey ever. He came from earth, uh, sorry, he came from heaven to earth, from earth to the cross, from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. He did all this to pay our debts so that we were no longer separated from God. Following Jesus is a lifelong journey of growth and learning <clears throat> that takes us to the fullness of who we were created to be, 
free of our ties to the world and free to follow Jesus wherever he leads us. Ted Olson, in his article, He Talked to Us on the Road, points to the, points to the story of the road to Emmaus as an example of how travel and what we encounter in person on the road can transform our understanding of things. The men on the road to Emmaus knew about the resurrection, but they didn't know it in a transformative way until Jesus appeared to them and they eventually realised who he was. It goes deeper than just grasping an event's historicity. It goes to its happiness. We are not just minds created to soak up knowledge. We are bodies that stand in one place at a time, seeing and feeling our surroundings. Travel is more than about knowing about God's goodness in our minds. It's about seeing, tasting and feeling. Doing these things in his created world and in other people. And though strangers we may be in this world, the reality is that God is here working in remarkable ways. So when we experience the sacredness of every, everything around us, whether we are on a walk, a morning commute, or sitting and just soaking up God's creation and the atmosphere, we will experience a transformed view which allows us to feel the sacred presence of God's guidance all around us. Physical journeys and spiritual journeys are often intertwined. There is something about leaving the comfort of home and going somewhere different that opens the door to all sorts of understanding, learning and growth. But that doesn't mean that travelling needs to be expensive or to far distant lands. Travel can be a walk on the beach or the country near your home. It can be as long or short as you like, but do it with God in mind. Use that time for the glory of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 39 tells us that God is everywhere. We realise that neither height nor death nor anything else in creation would be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you have a chance to travel anywhere, near or far, jump on it. But a break from routine doesn't mean a break from God. He will work in it and through it as long as we keep our eyes open and follow his guide. I just want to read Psalm 121 to you, which is often listed as the traveller's psalm. Lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. This psalm applies to our whole lives, wherever we are, whatever we do. <coughs> no matter what path we are on or will take in the future, we have this promise that God is walking with us, protecting us and guiding us now and forevermore. What a great promise. What a great God. Amen. Amen. Let's just pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, Thank you that you are always with us, always there to guide us. Support us with your strength and grace when we are weary. Give us eyes to see the needs of the people we encounter on our journey and show us how to meet those needs in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 final hymn is I hear the voice of Jesus say, I think you're able to keep your standing.
consider this one a bit of a dirge because of how minor the key of the song is, but I want you to interpret it more as trying to depict the our dire need of Jesus and how this is a prayer and how in that great dark desperate place that's where we're praying. Yeah, so I thought that might help us. <laughs> stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Saviour be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore Amen, Amen. and let's finish it by saying the grace of one another May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you for coming.